And so our first speaker up next, Dr. Karen Bales, is a professor of psychology and neurobiology, physiology, and behavior. She is the interim director of the California National Primate Research Center. Dr. Bales conducts groundbreaking research in the neurobiology of pair bonding and biparental care in prairie voles, titi monkeys, and seahorses. An important focus of her work is a way that our early experiences and human clinical practices can affect our social bonding. Early in her career, Dr. Bales contributed to the understanding of how hormones and environmental factors interact to predict maternal behavior in a wild, critically endangered monkey, the golden lion tamarind. Today, Dr. Bales will talk about the neuroscience of love and loss in pair bonding animals. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bales. Right? Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Get the slide, get the show started. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak today. Uh, as you just heard, I started out as what I would call a monkey watcher, um, kind of hiking around the rainforest to study what factors predicted how much care individual monkey mothers would, were willing to put into each offspring. So these monkey, uh, monkey moms were in families in which both the adult males and all the older kids help carry and provide food for the babies. So as a graduate student, my big question was, if I'm a monkey mom and I can get someone else to do everything for me, except for nurse, um, why do we still see so much variation in maternal care? And as I was studying this, I got more and more interested in what might be going on in the mother's brains and with their hormones. And more than that, what was happening in the brain with all of the relationships of these families, not just mother and infant, but also father and infant and the relationship between the mother and father. So this interest brought me to neuroscience and then to the California National Primate Research Center and to UC Davis. So in my laboratory here, we work with species in which adult individuals form a pair bond, a strong, selective social bond to another individual. Uh, the species that I work with include uh, TD monkeys, which you'll hear a lot about today, prairie voles, and most recently seahorses. These are all species in which adults form these pair bonds. Um, they also happen to be species in which we see important roles for the males in parenting of offspring. Seahorses are actually pretty famous for, for actually you know, gestating the offspring. Um, but the overarching goals uh, for our lab are therefore to understand the neurobiology of pair bonding, let's call it love, uh, as well as the neuroscience, uh, the neurobiology behind and the consequences of parenting. And finally, the positive and negative health consequences of social bonds. And some of these negative uh, consequences we'll talk about today as loss. Okay, so why do we study love and loss in animal models? Uh, in the last few years, there's been a growing interest in the neurobiology of social connectedness and its reverse, the lack of social connectedness or the even stronger emotion that we experience as grief. There's substantial evidence from human research that social connection matters to your health, whether this social connection is being examined uh, through social structure. So whether or not you're married, whether or not you have a larger or a smaller network size, uh, et cetera, or through social functions. So whether or not you have a sense of connection uh, that results from actual or, or lack of connection that results from actual or perceived inclusion or exclusion and also the quality of our social bonds. So are they high quality or low quality? How do we even define the quality of our social bonds? And so all of this matters to the way in which social connection uh, is translated into effects on human health. Now, again, the converse of the, the beneficial effects on, on human health 
is that the lack of desired social contact, whether it's loneliness, social isolation, or grief, can have really large effects. And these effects can be as large as the effects of exercise, diet, or smoking. So this is, this is no joke. Um, of these categories, social isolation, which is just a straight up lack of social contact, you're alone, um, is by far the best studied in both humans and animals. Now, so, so, social isolation is different from loneliness. Oops. Um, lone, you can be lonely in a crowd of people, right? So loneliness is the difference between the social connection you desire and what you actually have. Uh, and then finally, grief is defined specifically as the response to the loss of a specific individual, um, generally your attachment partner or other close person. And this is impactful enough that um, the Diagnostic and Standards Manual that psychiatrists use uh, in um, diagnosing uh, people now has a category called prolonged grief. Um, so let's just use cancer mortality as an example. We don't think necessarily of our social bonds being related to cancer risk, but loneliness increases the risk of cancer mortality by 9%, while social isolation or grief both increase cancer risk by over 20%. So again, these are huge effects. Now, grief is a human emotion and animals can't tell us uh, if they're feeling grief. But what we can study is the response to the loss of an attachment partner. Um, but I would argue that in order to study this, you have to be studying an animal that has an attachment partner, so an animal that forms pair bonds. And that excludes a lot of the normal laboratory animals uh, that, that we work with, like mice, rats, and rhesus monkeys. However, it does include teeny monkeys, prairie voles, and seahorses. So I've been throwing the word pair bond around a lot, and I should probably define it before I go further. So what's a pair bond? A pair bond is a psychological construct, meaning that you can't see it, you can't measure it directly, um, but you can measure the behaviors that reflect a pair bond. Uh, you can also think of it as an attachment bond between two adults. So for those of you who um, did you know, study psychology. Um, this definition is based on infant to mother attachment as defined by very famous developmental psychologists, uh, John Bowlby and uh, Mary Ainsworth. And essentially, these are, adult attach these are adult relationships that are characterized by a very strong preference for the partner, uh, distress upon separation from the partner, and I don't mean, you know, you miss them when they go to work. I mean, you're sincerely, you would, you would experience grief if they were gone. Um, and the ability of the partner to help you deal with other stressors. So it's a phenomenon called stress buffering or social buffering. And the idea is that if you are in um, a, a high quality attachment relationship, that partner should allow, should help you internally regulate your response to other stressors. And that stress buffering is important that I mentioned here because that's one very likely potential mechanism to connect pair bonds to later health. So there are two large areas of our research that I'm not really going to talk about much today, but I'd like to mention them. Um, the first is our questions about how developmental events can have long-term effects on the ability to form social bonds and the changes in the neurobiological systems that, that underlie those behavioral changes. Uh, so we've looked at a number of different types of early experience like differential parenting, clinical manipulations, prenatal stress, prenatal exposure to cannabis. Um, what I like to say about the differential parenting is that if you've ever looked at your romantic partner or maybe been on a date and just said, what on earth did your parents do to you? Uh, that's, that's kind of what we're studying, right? It's like, how do these early experiences change how we relate to adults romantically later? Um, the use of oxytocin in clinical settings um, also feeds right into the neurobiology underlying pair bonding, which I'll talk more about later. But as an example, uh, we use pitocin to induce labor. That's just artificial oxytocin. Um, all right, so the other piece of research that I won't go into in depth today is 
our comparative focus, uh, which now extends to seahorses, as I mentioned earlier. So the idea behind studying seahorses a species which is quite distantly related to, to humans and TD monkeys is to look for the commonalities and differences in the neurobiology of pair bonding. So for example, we've looked at the gene expression in the brain that changes with pair bonding and how the changes in the seahorse brain in those genes overlap with the changes in the prairieville brains when the prairieville's pair bond. And so you can kind of see here in our Venn diagrams that for upregulated genes, there are 150 that overlap between seahorses and prairie voles. And for downregulating genes, there are 90 that overlap. So today, though, I'm going to concentrate on our TD monkey research in which our primary goal has been to describe the basic neurobiology of pair bonds in a primate model. Um, this is important because previously, kind of the only model for the neurobiology of pair bonding were prairie voles. And as wonderful as they are, they're kind of a big jump from prairie voles to humans. So we argued we need um, an intermediate translational model. TD monkeys are a small South American monkey which forms very strong pair bonds. We have a colony of about 115 of them out at the primate center. Uh, the males are fantastic fathers. Uh, in fact, they're the primary caregivers for the infants and the infants are attached to the father, not the mother. So I did find a species where the mothers don't do anything except nurse the babies. It's TD monkeys. <laughs> um, so, forming a pair bond requires the involvement of a number of different neural systems. So this is getting us back to our theme of neural circuits. Um, we, need, we need several different capacities in order to form a pair bond. We need to be able to um, involve individual recognition pathways, reward pathways, and motor control pathways. So what I often tell my undergraduate students is that if you want to form a pair bond, you have to like your mate, at least at the beginning. Um, you have to find it you know, rewarding to interact with them, and you have to remember who they are, right? So, um, so what we see is that um, in forming a pair bond, we have these, these molecules in, in neural systems that express oxytocin and vasopressin, which underlie social recognition, and that they are co-localized with areas where we have reward pathways. So to back up a second, each hormone and neurotransmitter has a receptor that it has to bind to in order to have a physiological effect. So what we think is the difference between a species that forms pair bonds and a species that doesn't form pair bonds is that those receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin that allow you to remember um, your partner are on the same neurons or at least in the same areas as the receptors for dopamine and opioids, which are involved in motivation and reward. So that over time, as you interact more with this individual and you have these repeated um, rewarding interactions, uh, they, they become essentially, a, you, you start to have a conditioned response. To this, to this individual. You start to associate all these good things with them and their um, and the individual recognition. Okay, so what methods do we use to study the neurobiology of love and loss in teeny monkeys? One of the major methods we use uh, in our lab is PET scanning, which we do um, in collaboration with the Center for Molecular and Genomic Imaging here at UC Davis. So this is a method by which we attach a very, well, the Molecular and Genomic uh, Imaging Center <laughs> attaches um, a chemical to a very small amount of radiation. You then inject that into the monkey and you use the PET scanner to visualize where that radiation has gone to in the brain. So for instance, one chemical we commonly use is glucose. Glucose is the only fuel that your brain uses. Um, so if we give glucose with a little bit of radiation attached to it, we can then have the monkey in any kind of stimulus, you know, behavioral interaction that we want, give it 30 minutes, and then we anesthetize the monkey, put it in the PET scanner, and we can see where the glucose was taken up in the brain. And um, that reflects the time when they were awake, not when they were asleep. So this is a great method for which we can 
um, longitudinally study the brain in TD monkeys. Uh, we also use pharmacology. So this is manipulation of hormones, uh, and we often give the hormones intranasally, as you see here. And finally, we archive all the brain tissue from TD monkeys, which are euthanized for health reasons. So when you see um, brain slices, like I'm showing you up here today, those are from monkeys that were euthanized for health reasons, not for research. So um, the research that we do is completely non-terminal. So in pursuing these questions about pair bonding and the circuits underlying pair bonding, we have focused primarily but not exclusively on the hormone I've already mentioned several times, oxytocin. You might have heard it called the love hormone or the cuddle hormone. Um, oxytocin and the closely related hormone vasopressin are very small, they're only nine amino acids long hormones that are um, made in the brain. Um, but they were first really identified with pair bonding when it was found that their receptor distribution varied between vol species that pair bonded and vol species that did not pair bond. Uh, so oxytocin itself is involved in a large number of central and peripheral actions, uh, not, not limited to social behavior, uh, but also including the regulation of anxiety, birth, milk letdown, and reproductive behavior in mammals. So remember, that I said we think the key to being a pair bonding species is that you have dopamine receptors in the same brain areas on the same neurons in the same circuits as the oxytocin receptors. So in TD monkeys, when we first mapped the oxytocin receptors, which is the column in the middle of this um, uh, figure here, one area, which is called the lateral septum, popped out as having uh, both oxytocin and dopamine systems integrated together. And we think that this is one of the hubs of the circuit that we then have gone on to describe. So what do we find? Um, don't have a whole lot of time today, so I'm gonna summarize some major findings. The first set of studies we did was in male TD monkeys, and we found, first of all, that when they form a pair bond, glucose uptake in their whole brain goes up but it goes up even higher in areas that we would say they relate to social memory, the areas that contain dopamine receptors, including the lateral septum. Um, when we look directly at the lateral septum, uh, we, we find that we do see changes in the dopamine receptors with the formation of a pair bond. So we actually don't have a good pet dr um, tracer, pet, you know, dr drug essentially to measure oxytocin receptors in the brain, but we can measure the dopamine receptors. And we found that of, of all the areas we looked at, the lateral septum was the one where the dopamine receptors went up with pair bonding. Having just said that, this was in males. However, when we recently looked in females, we found something a little different. So you'll notice here that in these six females, in five out of six, the dopamine receptors in the lateral septum went down with pair bonding in a study that was done the same way as the original uh, study with males. Um, so one point that I also want to make today is that even though pair bonding behaviorally looks very similar in males and females, sometimes what's happening in the brain is completely different. And so that, that gives us a, a motivation to remember that we need to be looking at both uh, sexes. Uh, we've also shown that if we block dopamine receptors in males, we can almost eliminate mate guarding behavior, which is part of maintaining the pair bond uh, in males. So we don't know yet whether or not that's true for females. Uh, we do also know that these sex differences extend to the effects of oxytocin and vasopressin. So we've used pharmacology to show that if you give vasopressin to a male TD monkey, it strengthens he, his contact behavior towards his mate. You give it to a female, not only does she spend more time near the stranger, but she also increases her lip smacking at the stranger, which is a very cute behavior that looks a lot like a kiss. So, and where they go um, so, so vasopressin, completely different, um, different results in the two sexes. So over time, 
um, we mapped out our idea about the circuits that we think underlie pair bonding in TD monkeys. So in this diagram, each of the, the bigger rectangles is a brain area. Each of the smaller boxes on the borders are different types of receptors. The main idea here is that the stimuli coming from the partner are coming in through the different senses, the visual, the somatosensory, et cetera. They produce neural information that gets integrated with oxytocin and dopamine in the lateral septum, eventually leading to attraction behavior. So what we've done is spend lots of time testing each link and each of these little neurochemically related details in this model. Um, and in keeping with the theme of NeuroFest today, the point I wanna make is that the complex behavior of pair bonding relies not just on one brain area or one chemical, but on complicated neural systems like this. I also promised to talk a little bit about loss and the neurobiology of grief. Um, and I said earlier, grief is a, it's a natural response to the loss of a specific individual, and that's why pair bonding species make appropriate models. However, um, grief can sometimes be disabling. Um, so I'd like to put in a plug here too for the Neurobiology of Grief International Network, which is a collaboration of human and animal researchers working in this area. Now, back to our animal model, TD monkeys have long been known to show both behavioral and hormonal changes in response to separation from their partner. So this starts out behaviorally with elevations in locomotion and vocalization. Basically, they're searching for their partner. Uh, cortisol, which is a hormone that's released during stress and is related to the mobilization of energetic resources, also goes up. Uh, we've also mentioned that social buffering of stress or the ability of your partner to reduce the effects of other stressors uh, on, the, on an individual. Uh, but the point I'd like to make is that these are both situations in which your partner is helping to regulate your own internal state, whether it's in a negative way with separation or in a positive way with stress buffering. So we've previously characterized many of the neural and hormonal responses to, to separation in TD monkeys, either to a brief separation of 48 hours, um, a longer separation of two weeks, encounters with a strange female, or reunion with a partner. So um, the, the first row there is the um, condition, the second row is the brain area, and the third row are the hormones. And a couple of points I'd like to make uh, is that we see when we separate male TD monkeys from their partner temporarily, the f one of the first thing we see is reductions in many of the areas where there were increases with pair bonding. So after 48 hours, glucose uptake goes down in many areas, including the lateral septum. And after two weeks, the glucose uptake in the whole brain goes down. Um, you can also see here that the uh, reunion with a pair mate or meeting a new potential pair mate have lots of other effects as well. And the point here is that the loss and the reunion uh, with, with a loved one affect our brain and our entire body through horm homo hormones as well. So in our current project, we're looking at the interactions between oxytocin and the kappa opioid receptor and how they're involved in this ability of our partner to alter our internal state either by separation or social buffering. So the kappa opioid receptor is the receptor that binds dynorphin, which is a chemical that your brain releases during stress. And so it's what makes you feel kind of crappy when you're stressed out. And there are kappa opioid receptors located on oxytocin neurons in certain areas of your brain, which suggests that the two neurochemicals may be working together. Uh, we can measure the kappa opioid receptor using PET scans. So these are TD monkey brain scans from the front and from the sides. The front, top row is the front, the bottom row is the sides. You can see here that in our control scans, our PET tracer, our PET um, chemical, binds to the kappa opioid receptors. Now there's a very obvious difference in the middle row where we can block the kappa opioid receptors with a, a different drug called an antagonist. And on the right is the scan we get when we use a drug that activates the kappa opioid receptors. So this is all part of kind of a baseline study that we did. But the really cool thing here is that you can indirectly measure dynorphin release using this method. So 
if something stressful happens and you release dynorphin, there would be fewer available kappa opioid receptors for our radioactive chemical to bind to. So we'd see lower binding. Um, so it's sort of the, the converse, right? The more binding you have, that means less dynorphin was released. And I'm gonna finish up here actually with a sample of the data we're collecting on this exact topic. Um, however, this is obviously just one, one condition and one brain area, and we've looked at, we're looking at many, but um, we are looking at the effects of social buffering on kappa opioid receptor binding. So the idea again is how does your pair mate help you buffer your internal state? And so in, um, in this study, there were 10 pairs, 10 males and 10 females, uh, and each animal had a baseline condition, a stress condition, in which they were handled and received a blood draw and then sat alone for half an hour, or a socially buffer condition, in which they were handled, got a blood draw, and then they sat with their partner for half an hour. And then we scanned their brain to examine occupancy of the kappa opioid receptor. So the moment we're gonna just focus on this one area, the amygdala, and and one condition, stress buffering, but this is actually shown, the it looks a lot the same in a lot of other areas too, which is that um, here we're, we're measuring binding potential on the y-axis. You can see that males on average have a higher binding potential than females do. That means that more of our radio tracer was able to bind in the males and the females and suggests that the males release less of the endogenous um, the less of the chemical dynorphin. Meaning that one explanation of this is that the female partners were better at helping their male partner buffer stress than vice versa. And so I, this might not be surprising to the women in the room. Um, now, each one of these dots is also an individual monkey. So you can see, especially in females, there's some variation in the response. And so that might reflect individual variation in the strength of the bonds. So I'll just wrap up by saying that there's still a lot to be done in this area. Um, our next step in the current studies will be to test the effects of a kappa opioid receptor antagonist on mitigating the effects of being separated from a paramate. So this is a drug that's already in clinical trials for major depression. And our question is whether or not it can mitigate the separation distress. Uh, don't worry, the longest separation the TD monkeys ever undergo is two weeks and then they get their partner back. Um, so for all of these studies of love and loss, understanding the differences between neurobiology in males and females and understanding them at the circuit and systems level will both be critically important. Uh, I'd like to end up to, by gratefully acknowledging the people who actually do all the research in my lab, <laughs> um, as well as the agencies that have funded it. And I'd like to dedicate this lecture to Dr. Sally Mendoza, who did groundbreaking research on love and loss and TD monkeys. Uh, she was a great mentor to me as well as many cohorts of UC Davis undergraduate and graduate students and we lost her um, about two weeks ago to cancer. So um, a lot of what you see, saw here today rests on what she did as a scientist here at UC Davis. And I would be happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions? I think we have someone right here. Uh, she, she'll bring you. She'll bring you a mic. I think so. Everyone can hear your question. Yeah, right, right there. Yeah. The discussion makes me think of Shadow and Jackie that I've been watching. You know, the bald eagle pair and big bear, and mm -hmm. I wonder what your thoughts are on their bonding. Okay, so so I heard the bald bald eagle. Um, uh huh. Oh, uh huh. Uh -huh. oh, yeah, so birds are famous actually for being great pair bonding animals. And part of it is that, well, at least part of the evolutionary theory behind it is that um, since, since both parents can feed the babies, then there's, you know, there's, um, more of a, it's more even as far as, you know, 
one of them not being able to abandon the babies. Um, whereas in mammals, uh, it's uh, obviously mom has to stay or else the baby can't eat. So, um, you know, I haven't seen a whole lot on pair bonds between adult birds except in zebra finches, but um, they're, yeah, they're, they're, sort of, they're sort of poster children for being good pair bonders. <laughs> Taking care of the eggs, yeah. Exactly. Sure. Answer any other questions? I think there's one over here. Uh, you said the hormone response with um, the TD monkeys was like, you know, um, between with love and loss. How similar is that to humans in the human brain? Okay, so if I heard you correctly, you're asking how similar is what we're seeing in TD monkeys to humans? Um, so that's always a hard question, right? Um, because the, the way that we do research in humans is so different. Uh, we have actually mapped, we haven't published it yet, but we've mapped oxytocin receptor in humans. Humans also have oxytocin receptor in the lateral septum, but humans have it throughout the brain. Right? So I think that the way that we form pair bonds actually is quite, probably quite similar, but what humans have that I would argue is fairly unique is our capacity to maintain multiple really close relationships at the same time. So TD monkeys, there's this close relationship between the adults and the kids are, it, it, it would, Maybe be a little too extreme to say they don't even like the kids, but that's the feeling you get when you watch well, teeny monkeys. But you know, as humans, we love our children, we love our parents, we love our partners. We can maintain all of those multiple bonds at the same time. So I think that's what makes humans different. Um, but there, we lack experimental control for studies in humans, and that makes it challenging. Uh, you know, I've always said that, like, people. Oh, okay, so sometimes people ask. If, you're, you know, if your studies are non-terminal in TD monkeys, why wouldn't you just do it in a human, right? But so far, UC Davis has not agreed to let me take two undergrads, throw them in a room, and tell them to form a pair bond, um, which, which I can do with TD monkeys. <laughs> um, although we do now actually give them input into who they get to, to choose. So uh, if anyone wants to find me in the break, I can tell you how we do speed dating studies in TD monkeys. Um, but yeah, I think that's the main difference. Are there any studies looking at uh, either anatomical or receptor density differences in people with reactive attachment or other attachment disorders? So there's very few studies in, um, in oxytocin receptor in primates at all, and only one in humans besides the one where we haven't, we ha we, that we haven't published yet. Um, Part of it is because there were a lot of technical issues with looking at receptor binding um, in primates that, and humans um, that we've just gotten past. So the only study that I'm aware of that sort of um, is looking at differences within humans populations uh, looked at developmental disorders like autism spectrum disorders and there, there were some differences in oxytocin receptor distribution there. But you bring up a really interesting question which is I think how attachment differences and attachment styles feed into these systems and at least in the TD monkeys they're really predictive like uh, of how you're going to act as an adult like your kind of your attachment style as a kid. Um, with your dad, so for what it's worth. <laughs> but yeah, we, we need a lot more uh, research on this in humans, I think. Last question. I'm just curious, do pair bonds last for life? That's a great question. Um, so as far as we can, t so, so in the TD monkeys, um, if they lose a mate, for health reasons or if we experimentally separate them. If you give them enough time, they will form a new pair bond. Uh, we also occasionally see what we would call a, you know, a de facto divorce, meaning they start squabbling enough that we have to split them up. Um, but we have had lots of pairs that have lasted a really long time. 
Uh, the bad news is that when we, we tested, uh, we did a study where we were looking, using eye tracking to see who, who are these monkeys interested in? Are they look, do they look more at their mate? Do they look at a stranger? And um, over time, they looked at their mate less and less. Um, so, so there's that. But I, and they do have a lot of similarities to human pair bonding in that some seem really tight, some, some last a long time, sometimes we have to break them up. Um, and they, they are capable of being serial monogamous, serial pair bonders like humans are. Thank you so much, Dr. Bales. Thank you. Um, and thanks. And I would uh, like to, it's my pleasure uh, to, to bring up our next speaker, who is Dr. Diazanu Fioravante. Uh, 